part two of A Hero Never. The Raiders moved along after cutting down those unfortunate three. They hadn't even taken anything they dropped. It was as if they were warriors of a higher purpose than wealth. As if the carnage itself was greater than that. Cell had a name for people like that. Psychopaths. People he had known on the road and worked with on occasion. This is what happened when people forgot what it meant to be human and thought that being an animal was a better idea. Cell was at the edge of town with nothing but his guitar and the clothes on his back. He could venture into the waste with nothing, but that was still death, just slower. When the psychos moved on, he used the blanket of dust to pick over the bodies of his fallen neighbors. He ignored the look of surprise that Echo's severed head gave him when he rifled through her bag taking her umbrella weapon. He mulled over taking a broken crossbow from the murdered gardener when a figure emerged like a ghost from the dust. It was too late to hide, so he pointed the bladed umbrella forward and hoped that he hadn't overplayed his hand and stayed for too long. He breathed easy when he saw it was Jazz, another survivor from town who had been rather new. She was a dark-skinned woman wearing a gray traveling cloak. All he knew about her was she was a mechanic whose vehicle had broken down in the settlement and was in the midst of gathering things that might put her back on the road. Now, she was just as stranded as he was. She hacked away at Echo's metallic arm and tossed the blood-drenched thing in her bag. She gave him a crisp head nod of recognition, but little else. After 30 seconds of scavenging, the two were away into the heart of the storm. They didn't even speak to each other until the settlement was but a forgotten memory. Where you going? Jazz asked Cell. North, he explained. North? North, he said again. Just north? Why not? You just plan on living out in the wilds? Whatever will be, will be, he said with the nihilistic confidence of a man that didn't mind death. I'm going to Ryderson City. Maybe I can salvage a heap and get myself on wheels. Cell nodded, but didn't quite acknowledge or show that he cared or didn't. She began to somewhat lead the way with a compass she had in her pocket. And Cell subtly began to follow her lead. Somewhere was better than nowhere, no matter where that was. After three hours of solid travel through a faceless land of nothing, the two saw a mirage in the distance. And a man with a wicker hat and pack animal. But they avoided him. They were not tempting fate by interacting with people they couldn't understand. Hours after that, the two saw wild dogs congregating on top of a dune. The animals were just as feral and desperate as they were. The two decides to make a run for it, using their huge head start to make their escape. The dogs barreled down on them, needing to kill to live. Cell broke ahead. When he looked back at Jazz falling behind, he didn't stop. Even after she put up a decent fight, he kept going. He wished things could have been different. But he wishing didn't make it so. He assumed she was ripped apart, but then again, he'd never truly know. After running himself ragged through the waste, he came across a rocky plateau with propses of random caverns. He entered one at random and heard the relentless buzzing of bees. If it wasn't for his desperation, he would have skipped it altogether. Right by the cavern's entrance, not two steps inside, was a little girl sitting on rocks. Hi, she said with a chipper demeanor that was an athema to the dismal heart of this hopeless land. Aside from her unusual adorableness, both of her arms were formed of metal, which was made of reclaimed scraps of a dying land. She must have lost the limbs when she was very young because they were made specific for her little body. Hi, Cell said back. Where are your parents? He asked, halfway questioning her to test if she was the bait for an oncoming trap. Dead, but they were dead already. My brother was watching me, but he's dead too. Raiders came to our settlement, and he told me to run and not look back, so I did. So he's dead too now. Oh, Cell said, trying not to make light of the tragedy. I'm little bombshell, she said with the confidence only a child could. 
That honey smells amazing, she said, not even waiting for Cell to respond. The little girl, who was no older than eight, entered the cavern further. Cell followed. There was an uncharacteristically huge colony of bees flying in the back of the cave in a miniature city of insects. At the far back wall there were jars as if someone was tending these insects. A dead man sunk in the dirt with a crossbow in one hand and a half filled jar of honey in the other. Where Cell saw a moment of caution, Little Bombshell saw opportunity with none of the consequences of danger. She walked up to the hive as if she were one of them and started rifling through the dead man's gear. She ate the honey without a second thought. She walked back with the man's gear and the honey. Cell was as impressed as he was concerned. The desperate musician ate a little of the honey and smiled, but he heard the sounds of the hive intensify. And unconsciously, he decided against further intrusion because of the shaky truce between man and beast. We should sleep here said Cell to the little girl. He could have just let her run off, but he chose not to. He wanted to think it was because it was a way to not have her alert others, but in his heart, he didn't want to see the child come to harm. When the two woke in the morning, Cell heard the sound of feet moving towards the entrance. He pushed the little girl awake, she who managed to nestle in at his side like she had known him her whole life. Hide! Cell told the little girl. Little Bombshell didn't want to do what he said. Not from fear, but from curiosity. Cell had to add the base and gravity of an adult's edict to a child. She heeded his words as if compelled to listen. Cell held his breath and hoped that his roll of the dice favored friend over foe. Three people, malnutrition and scantily clad white cloth, walked into the cavern with bare feet. Two men and a woman, each with side satchels. The three were more pleased to see a stranger than cautious. Cell reached for his guitar to play it. It was his opening move when he first encountered travelers he didn't know. A favorable talent when even something as simple as a smile could be the difference between death or friendship. I'm Jarek. This is Julio and Fatima, said one of the lathe men. The woman reached into her bag. You must be famished. Here, have some sustenance, she said, producing a half jar of honey. Little Bombshell took the jar and spooned out the amber goo with two fingers. It's good, said the little girl. The three looked to the little girl, not knowing she was even there to begin with. Hello, little one, said Fatima. Oh, hello, said Little Bombshell. Come travelers and see the mother and be welcome into our community, said Julio. You just live out here? Cell asked, not fully committed to the idea of joining any community without knowing whatever he could about them. As Cell asked his questions, the three farmed the honey, and the bees did not strike them. They were just another drone in their colony going about their task. Cell, who had never stopped playing his guitar, noticed that not one of them had a weapon amongst them. So who's the mother? Cell asked. She keeps us safe. Leo said casually. The three moved to leave the cavern and urged the two survivors to follow. As they exited the dusty plateau, there were others scantily clad in white sitting, standing, and ambling about almost aimlessly. None of them seemingly in much of a rush or having much concern, which for this dying world was very unusual. Out of the several cavern entrances, Jarek led Little Bombshell and Cell to one that didn't have an identity over any other. Straggler bees wandered amongst the people with no fear of any of these humans. When the two entered the cavern, only Fatima entered with them. They walked over a thin sheen of honey when their feet touched ground. But that was the least thing they had to deal with. There were calcified human bodies merged into the wall as if built into a living hive. Cell never stopped playing, figuring if he kept calm, so would they.